This talk is going to focus on the limitations of machine learning from observational data, particularly in the health data context. And I'm going to show how Bayesian networks can provide more accurate assessment and decision making from typical health data than is possible from pure machine learning methods from data alone. We've entered an era where it's assumed that if you have sufficient data, clever statistical machine learning methods will enable you to learn useful things from the data. This is increasingly the case for medical data, where, for example, we want to be able to predict specific diseases from observable risk factors or determine optimal treatment strategies. But there are severe limitations to what we can learn from observational data alone. Now, this doesn't mean that I'm saying we have to rely only on randomized controlled trials because they've got their own severe limitations. This talk is going to focus on how causal models, specifically Bayesian networks, enable us to do much more with observational data and get more accurate results than is possible from pure machine learning from data alone. I'm going to start with an explanation of why we need to incorporate causal reasoning into the observational data. Only causal reasoning exposes the paradoxes that produce flawed or biased results from observational data but it's not sufficient to produce causal models. We need a calculus for performing inference on these models, which is where Bayes and Bayesian networks come in. And I'm going to show how Bayesian networks resolve the causal paradoxes, and I'm going to present a number of real-world examples. Finally, I'm going to show that no matter how big the data, we'll never learn causality from observational data alone. Now, I'm not arguing that pure data-driven machine learning in healthcare is a complete waste of time. It can work very well in applications like image recognition, where it's possible, for example, to do as well as human experts in identifying radiology abnormalities. But that's very different from learning or incorporating causal knowledge, which is required for the type of application that we're going to be focusing on. To illustrate the need for causal reasoning, I'll start with a non-medical but typical example of a big data-driven problem where machine learning algorithms are used. So in this example, we're talking about banks gathering comprehensive data on customers to whom they give loans. They use this information to help them to risk assess future customers, i.e. those most likely to default on loans. So here are the customers who defaulted. What statistical machine learning algorithms do is learn what the distinguishing features are of those customers who default and how they differ from those who don't default. Now the first problem with this type of data is that although it might be big, it's completely missing data for an entire class of customers who we also need to learn about. Specifically, as it's restricted to customers who were given loans, it contains no information at all on those who were refused loans. And we say that such data is censored and therefore biased. So we can learn nothing about customers who refuse loans and why they were refused. And this creates other problems leading to fundamentally flawed algorithms. So take a look at the following cases highlighted here. These are a small number of unemployed teenagers given very large loans who didn't default. Now most unemployed teenagers asking for big loans were refused because they would almost certainly default but they never made it into the data and so we don't learn such obvious characteristics. Instead what we've got here are a small number who don't default because these were special case exceptions they were the children of wealthy customers known to the bank. So instead of learning that unemployed teenagers are high risk the purely data driven algorithm learns the exact opposite unemployed teenagers with big loans don't default. Now, this is a model which represents what all machine learning algorithms, statistical algorithms, are essentially doing. They learn the target outcome, in this case loan defaulted, as a function of the inputs which they've got data. But what the model can't learn is the impact and relationships involving unobserved variables. So in this case, the variable loan given was censored because we only had data for those given loans. We were also missing the special client information and the key latent variable which is all about loan suitability. Now people with expert domain knowledge and a common sense understanding of causality can provide this kind of graphical causal model before considering the data. In a typical medical data driven approach we'll have observations from a large number of people or patients. I mean in the example here which is taken from a study attempting to build a model to predict those especially at risk patients entering accident emergency with head injuries. We've got a bunch of variables 
representing observable factors about the patient and a record here of the outcome. And the idea is we want to use the data to learn a model to help identify patients most at risk of death and give those the most urgent treatment. Now again, a typical regression-based machine learning model attempts to learn outcomes as a function of the observable variables. And such models rarely achieve better than 70% accuracy and often produce counterintuitive and incorrect results for important outliers. And in particular, results of such a model will appear to be working well in the sense that as the risk factors collectively become more critical, the predicted probability of survival decreases. But what happens in the most critical cases? You might see an uptick in survival probability, which is kind of like strange. Why should the most critical be more likely to survive than those who are slightly less critical? Well, it's explained in a proper causal model. So in a causal model, things like the delay in arrival injury type are going to impact on the seriousness of the injury. Things like arterial pressure, brain scan result, pupil dilation, these are simply symptoms of the seriousness of the injury. And the ability to recover is influenced by both the seriousness of the injury and the age of the patient. So these are our risk factors and causes. But most crucially, the outcome is influenced not just by the ability to recover, but by whether or not the patient receives treatment or you know, the urgent treatment. Now, here's the thing. Those patients, especially at risk, are already known to the surgeons and likely to get urgent treatment to avoid the worst outcomes. That's why you get the anomalies and inaccuracies of the data learned from the regression models and the observational data alone. Now, most of the problems arising from learning from observational data are the results of two very common causal paradoxes, namely Simpson and Bergson. We'll start with a simple hypothetical example of Simpson's paradox. So imagine a new drug, it's being tested on a group of 800 people, 400 men, 400 women with a particular disease. Half the people randomly selected are given the drug and the other half are given a placebo. Overall, we've got the following drug trial results. 50% of those who got the drug recovered compared to just 40% of those who didn't get the drug. So clearly the drug is effective. Well, is it? Well, it turns out in this case that if we dig down into the results by sex of the patient, we get something very different. So what we can see here is that among the females, those who didn't take the drug, there was a 30% recovery rate compared to 20% of those who did take the drug. So the females who didn't take the drug did better than those who did, but it's the same case of males. In the case of males, 70% of those who didn't take the drug recovered compared to 60% who did. So in each subcategory, the drug is worse than the placebo, even though apparently overall it's better. But clearly this is the correct result. And in case you're thinking there's any statistical trickery going on here, there isn't. You can, if you just add the numbers up, you can see that these, add, these numbers tally. What's happening here is that we've got this paradox as a result of the fact that although the drug taken does impact on the recovery, the sex is influencing both whether or not the drug's taken and also the recovery. Far fewer women, 100, happen to have taken the drug than men, 300. But men are more likely to recover naturally from this condition than women. And that's what's causing the paradox. Now, while that was a hypothetical and contrived example, the following is based on a real observational study. So in this study, there were two treatments, called them A and B, for patients with kidney stones. So out of 700 patients, half, 350, were observed with treatment A and half with treatment B. Now, overall, the success rate for treatment B was 83% compared to treatment A, only 78%. So a higher number of patients with treatment B had a successful outcome. But it turns out that treatment B was worse in every subcategory when we split the data by the size of the kidney stone. So patients with small kidney stones, treatment A had a 93% success rate compared to 87% for treatment B. So treatment A was better at dealing with small stones, but for big stones, well, the overall success rate is lower because it's more difficult to treat the larger stones. Treatment A 
has the better recovery rate, 73% compared to 69% for treatment B. And again, you can see that the numbers here add up correctly. There's no trickery going on. What's happening is, again, we've got this same causal paradox going on here, whereby treatment does impact on recovery, but the stone size influences both treatment and recovery. Specifically, patients with the large stones were much more likely to be given treatment A than treatment B. So it's inevitable you get this kind of limitation with our observational studies when you've got these so-called confounding variables. Suppose we want to assess the effectiveness of a treatment and we know the following about the true population. In every 100 people in the population, eight received the treatment and survived, two received the treatment and didn't survive. So the survival rate for those who received the treatment is 80%. But out of every 100 people, 63 didn't receive the treatment and survived, and 27 who didn't receive the treatment didn't survive. So the survival rate out of those who didn't receive the treatment is 70%. So clearly, the treatment is effective because the treatment really increases the survival probability. If we attempt to collect data about the treatment for this population, it's going to be subject to systemic bias. In particular, people who didn't receive the treatment are most likely to be left out. So these are the people who make it into the data set. And amongst those, the ones not surviving are most likely to be missing from the data set. So while the survival rate of those receiving the treatment is still 80%, they still stay in the data set. We've got all of those. In the data set, the survival rate amongst those who didn't receive the treatment is 94%. And so here, in the data set, it appears that the treatment reduces the survival probability. And again, what we have here is a causal explanation, because although the treatment is impacting on the probability of survival, both whether or not the people got the treatment and whether or not they survive influences whether or not they're in the sample. So this is what we call a collider, which is creating this Bergson's paradox. So for both paradoxes, there's a hidden causal factor impacting the observed data. So we have a common confounding variable for Simpson's paradox, which means that the causal relationship exists, but it's affected or even inverted by the confounder from the observational data. And for Bergson's paradox, we've got this common collider, which again means that although a causal relationship exists between the treatment and the outcome, it's affected or even inverted by the collider. Now, Judea Pearl, one of the leading figures in artificial intelligence, proposed a so-called ladder of causation, which has three rungs, seeing, doing, and imagining. So at level one, we learn by seeing, but we only learn associations this way, such as from this trial's data, is this drug effective at stopping headaches? Or in our bank loan example, we can learn whether unemployed people given loans are more likely to default. At level two, we learn by doing. So if I take this drug, will it stop my headache? Or in the bank example, if I'm unemployed, will I default on a loan? At level three, we learn by imagining the so-called counterfactuals we have to learn, such as if I hadn't taken this drug, would my headache still have stopped? Or in the bank example, if I'd been employed, would I still have defaulted on my loan? Now, Pearl argues that if we rely only on statistical machine learning from data, then we can only ever get to level one on this ladder. Get into both levels two and three, the intervention and counterfactual level, requires causal knowledge of the relationships, not just between factors in the data sets, but also including unobserved ones. Now we've seen that there are real benefits in simply drawing graphical models like the ones we've seen so far, before doing any data collection or analysis because it can guide the collection of the right data and avoid most of the errors people make when analysing and learning from data. But to use such models for prediction, inference and decision making, we need a computational framework to support it. And that's where Bayes' theorem and Bayesian networks come in because they provide exactly such a framework. So Bayes' theorem is all about how to properly update our prior belief in some unknown hypothesis when we get new evidence about it. And here's an intuitive explanation of Bayes. So imagine an example of breast cancer screening. So Sarah takes a screening test for breast cancer, and about one in a thousand women of her age have it. 
So the test is accurate in the sense that it's got a 99% true positive rate. So if you've got the disease, there's a 99% chance it will correctly give you a positive. And if you haven't got the disease, there's only a 5% chance it will say that you're positive, which equivalently, you've got a 95% chance of correctly giving a negative result if you haven't got the disease. If you know that Sarah tests positive, what's the probability that she has breast cancer? In a well-known study of Harvard uh, Medical School staff and students, when presented with this problem, over half of them gave the answer 95%, and the average answer was 65%. So most people assume it's very likely that she has breast cancer given the positive test result, but it's wrong. And that's because they're failure to take account of the prior probability here, which is the low probability, one in a thousand, that women of her age have the disease. And to see why, Imagine a thousand people. About one person is going to have the disease and the test will almost certainly test positive for this person. But that leaves 999 who don't have the disease. And of those, about 5% are going to test positive. That's about 49 out of 50 people who don't have the disease testing positive. So if we now strip away all those testing negatives, we're only looking at those testing positive only one out of about 50 who test positive actually have the disease. That's about 2%. And that's very different from the 95% assumed by most medics. And of course, that was a visual explanation of Bayes' theorem. More formally, with Bayes' theorem, we start with some hypothesis, H, like the person has a disease. We've got some prior probability for that, which in this case was 1 in 1,000. That's probability of 0.001. And we can represent that as a so-called probability table. And we get some evidence in here, positive test result. And we know the probability of that evidence given whether the person has a disease. So we know the probability of the positive test result if the person has a disease is 99%, that's 0.99. And the probability of positive test result if the person doesn't have the disease is 0.05. So we've got the probability table here. When H is true, there's a 99% chance that the test result will be positive. When H is false, there's a 5% chance that the test result will be positive. But of course, we want to know the posterior probability of H given the evidence. That's the probability of H given the positive test result. And what Bayes' theorem does is provide the formula for that in terms of the things we know. In particular, it's equal to the probability of E given H times the probability of H. We know each of those divided by this. So we simply plug the values in here and we arrive at the answer, which is just under 2%, which is what we saw from the visual explanation. And this is an example of a very simple two variable Bayesian network. This is a full specification of a Bayesian network. And in these models, we can do prediction, which is forward inference from cause to effects, but importantly, we can do backward inference from effect to cause. And in general, a Bayesian network will consist of multiple variables, not just two. And the necessary Bayesian inference calculations, unfortunately, are quite complex because the inference has to propagate around the whole network. And we need algorithms for forming that complex Bayesian inference. Now, fortunately, efficient propagation algorithms have been around since the late 1980s and have been implemented in tools like Agena, so that once the Bayesian network structure and the conditional probability tables have been specified, that's the full specification of the Bayesian network, all of the Bayesian inference computations are performed automatically. This is a classic example of a simple Bayesian network model called the Asia model. The objective of the model is to determine the most likely diagnosis for a patient entering a chest clinic. The nodes here represent variables which may or may not be known, and for simplicity, all of these nodes are Boolean, meaning they have just two states, which were taken to be yes or no in this case. There's a directed edge between two nodes if there is a causal or influential relationship between those nodes. For example, a person who is a smoker is more likely to have lung cancer than a person who is a non-smoker, similar to bronchitis. And a person who has any of these conditions is more likely to have the symptom of dyspnea, which is shortness of breath. Now associated with every node is a probability table. 
So for example, for the no smoker, the probability table is just 50-50 for yes or no, because that represents the fact that 50% of the people who enter the chest clinic are smokers. Whereas for visit to Asia, only 1% of the people have had a recent visit to Asia. For nodes which have parents, the probability table is a conditional probability table. So we have to give the probabilities conditioned on the states of the parents nodes. So if a person is a smoker, there's a 10% chance that this person would have been diagnosed with lung cancer. And if the person is a non-smoker, there's only a 1% chance they would have been diagnosed with lung cancer. Now, in its prior or so-called marginal state, the probabilities here represent just what is known about the population of people entering the chest clinic. But of course, we want to use the model for individualized risk assessment. So suppose a patient comes in and is a non-smoker. So we're going to enter that observation. And now what's going to happen is we're going to run the model and it's going to do all of the Bayesian inference. And in particular, look at how the probabilities of these nodes change. So a non-smoker, probability of lung cancer went down, probability of bronchitis went down. Similarly, these all went down. At this point, if that's all you know about this person, then it's unlikely that they've got any of these conditions because the highest probability here is 30% for bronchitis. But suppose they report shortness of breath. When we run the model again, again, see what happens. These two increase by a little bit, but they're still quite low. But bronchitis is now over 75%. So you would diagnose bronchitis as a likely condition in this case. Well, suppose we send the patient for an x-ray and it comes back positive. Run the model again. TB and lung cancer have gone up quite a bit now, but they're still way below bronchitis, which is still the likely diagnosis at this point. However, suppose we decide to check if this person had a recent visit to Asia, and it turns out they did. In this case, when we run the model, everything changes. Tuberculosis, almost from nowhere, now becomes the most likely probable diagnosis. What I'm now going to show you is that Bayesian networks enable us to resolve the causal paradoxes that we've seen, and they also enable us to get to levels two and three of Pearl's ladder of causation. So first of all, we're going to see how we can resolve Simpson's paradox by couching it as a Bayesian network. Okay, so we have our two treatments for kidney stones, treatment A and treatment B, and we're interested in which is more likely to lead to full recovery. So we can see that in the study, an equal number of patients had treatments A and B and that the overall recovery rate was 80%. Now for treatment A, when we run the model, we observed that the recovery rate was 78%. And for treatment B, recovery rate is 83%. So overall, treatment B seems to be the more effective. If I reset the model, I'm now going to reveal the hidden confounder, which is of course the stone size. Now, if the stone size is small, let's see what happens. Well, first of all, the overall recovery rate is higher, 88%. And it's also more likely that treatment B would have been given for a small stone. In fact, with the stone size fixed at small, let's compare treatments A and B now. With treatment A, the recovery rate is up to 93%, whereas with treatment B, the recovery rate is only 87%. So treatment A is better than treatment B for small stones. What about for large stones? Let's look at treatment B. So treatment B has a recovery rate of 69%, and treatment A has a recovery rate of 73%. So treatment A is more effective for both small stones and large stones, even though overall treatment B seemed to be better. Of course, the reason for this is that for large stones, which are more difficult and less likely to lead to recovery, treatment A is more likely to be used than treatment B. If someone has recovered with a large stone, then it's much more likely that they were treated with A. We get that from the observational data. That's the explaining why. If we want to simulate a randomized controlled trial, what we have to do is break the link from stone size to treatment. So all I'm going to do is delete that, reset this, and now I can see the true effect of A independent of stone size. So recovery rate for treatment A is 83%, and the recovery rate for treatment B is 78%. 
if I don't know the stone size, which treatment should I choose if I want to optimize my chances of recovery? So if recovery is true, you're better off with treatment A. Next, we're going to show how Bayesian networks resolve Bergson's paradox for the example that we already saw. So here we're going to return to the example of where we had a treatment for a particular condition which was genuinely effective in that it increases the survival rate for those treated. But the observational data was showing that the treatment was not effective. So let's see how that happens. From the observational data alone, we see that 92% survived. But for those who don't get the treatment in the observational data, the survival rate increases to 94%, whereas for those who get the treatment, the survival rate decreases to 80%. Let's just remove this. So what's the explanation for this? Well, again, we're going to now reveal the hidden collider, which is that the observational data is based on a bias sample. So the only people in the observational data are those who are in the sample. And if we remove the constraint that they're in the sample, for those who got the treatment, they're all in the sample, but for those who didn't get the treatment, only 59% are in the sample. And for those who didn't get the treatment and who didn't survive, only 11% of those are in the sample. To see the unbiased results, we now see that if they didn't get the treatment, there's a 70% survival rate. And if they did get the treatment, there's an 80% survival rate. So the treatment's genuinely effective, but that was hidden because of the bias sample. We can also use Bayesian networks to get us to level three on Pearl's ladder, which is the counterfactual reasoning. We just need an appropriate causal model, which we can create an almost identical counterfactual world copy. So for example, here's our model of the kidney stone treatment problem. So here we know we can enter real world observations like a particular patient had treatment B but didn't recover. And with this information, the model updates the real world information about the probability that this patient had a small or large stone. We know that most patients who had treatment B had a small stone, but because the treatment didn't work, for this patient, the revised probability that the stone is small is actually lower knowing that the treatment didn't work. So all of that is what we know and learn about the real world. Now we create a linked copy of the model as a counterfactual world. We simply copy and paste the nodes that can change in the counterfactual world, which is the treatment and the recovery, not the stone size. And this ensures that the probability for recovery conditioned on stone size is the same as it is in the real world. Now, since we want to simulate an intervention for treatment, we break the link from the stone size to treatment in the counterfactual world. In the counterfactual world, we could therefore answer the counterfactual question, would this patient have recovered if they'd been given treatment A instead of treatment B? That's because we can simulate the effect of using A on the patient with the updated information that we learn about the stone size in the real world. And what we can see is that there's an 85% chance that this patient would have recovered. So it's very likely that they would have recovered if they'd been given treatment A. And we can put all these ideas together in a generic example of some medical observational data for a particular disease and treatment. Now here is a general example of how we might go about learning from observational data the risk of dying from a particular disease and also the effectiveness of particular treatments for that disease. The variables here are those which data are observed and collected. So because certain risk factors are considered to impact on the development of the disease, we record those. And in particular, it's assumed that family history is the most critical risk factor for the disease. We also record whether a person has specific symptoms which are known to occur for those with the disease. And obviously we record whether or not the person did die, whether the disease was recorded and whether the person had the treatment. But of course, this is not the full causal model. Let's reveal the full causal model with the unobserved variables. First note that we generally never actually observe with certainty if a person has the disease. 
What we observe is whether or not the disease is recorded based on some test, which may have some inaccuracies. Moreover, if we don't perform the test, such as, for example, when there's no access to health care or when the disease simply isn't suspected, then irrespective of whether the person has the disease, we generally won't have it recorded. And finally, because this is observational data, it's likely to have sample bias. For example, it's more likely that we'd have collected data from people who had a family history of this disease and or for whom the disease was recorded. The probability of death from the disease that we see here represents the true population probability. But this is not what we learn from the data because the data is biased by what's in the sample. In the sample, we observe a much higher death rate than the true population death rate. So there's going to be a bias to all of our observations. What we're going to do now is look at how the probability of disease and probability of disease recorded, as well as probability of death from disease, change when, for example, we observe for a particular person all of these particular risk factors. So all of these risk factors are present. And when we run the model, let's just see what happens, focus on what happens here. So notice that the probability that a person has the disease has gone up, as has the probability that the disease is recorded. And the probability of dying from the disease has also increased. So all of this is working in the way you would expect. But notice that the bias from being in the sample and the possible test inaccuracy means that you've got this mismatch between the true probability of the disease and whether or not the disease is recorded. Now let's see what happens if this person has symptoms. It's now very likely you've got the disease and there's a slightly better match between the probability of disease and whether it's recorded. Again, you're tending to overestimate the probability of the disease. But of course now the increased probability of death is there from the disease. So if you were observing this patient with these risk factors and these symptoms, you'd be predicting a 15.8 probability of death from the disease, which is an overestimate because in the population as a whole, it's only 5.7. But let's go back to the bias sample because that's what we're learning from. In addition to the overestimation of the probability of death from the disease, the next problem we have is with this critical risk factor, family history. So I want you to observe very carefully what happens now, because something very surprising is going to happen here. So when we run the model, in particular look at the probability of death from the disease and the probability of the disease. Well, the probability of dying from the disease has actually gone down even though the probability of having the disease has gone up significantly. And this is explained by this collider. Because we know that there's a family history of the disease, then the reason it was in the sample is explained away by that, rather than by the disease being recorded. So the probability that the disease was recorded has gone down because of that family history being true. And that's why we've got this completely counterintuitive and wrong observation that the presence of the family history is decreasing the probability of death from the disease. If, of course, we remove that constraint, and so we've now got this for the population as a whole, then when the family history is true, there's the probability. And if there's no family history, probability of dying is, of course, much lower, which is what you'd expect. Now, the other thing, of course, that we can show is problematic here is, of course, the impact of the treatment. So again, looking at this particular patient and the probability of death from the disease with or without the treatment, again, we get this result, which is the opposite of the reality. In this case, if they don't get the treatment, the probability that they just die from the disease decreases significantly, whereas if they get the treatment... there's a significant increase in the probability that they die from the disease. But of course, we can get around that by simply breaking the link into treatment. So we run this again. With the treatment, the probability of death from the disease is 3.5%. And without the treatment, the probability of death from the disease is much higher. So the treatment does work, but you would not have known that from the observational data alone. 
Some recent real-world examples, most of which arose from the EPSRC project that I was leading between 2017 and 2021. So one example we developed in 2020 was a personalised risk assessment tool for COVID. And you can run this model yourself. It's a web app. If you go to that web address, you can see this running. This gives you a feel for the complexity of the model. And of course, there are lots of hidden nodes here which are not shown. Here's a very recent model that our team has developed for pregnancy outcomes, which is relevant to the population of England and Wales. Here's a recent model for the clinical diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. And this was a model that predicts coagulopathy within 10 minutes of hospital care. These are all published papers. This was a, a Bayesian network for diagnosing rheumatoid arthritis. And this was a so-called dynamic Bayesian network for decision-making and management of glucose control in gestational diabetes. And previously, the team had worked with the trauma specialists at Bath into developing models for predicting physiological disorders. So this is earlier, again, early identification of trauma-induced coagulopathy and a model for predicting limb viability to help decision-making whether or not to amputate. Now, finally, we come to the question of the limitations of big data. The examples I've presented have been where we've got typical observational data which even though it's big, is going to have inevitable limitations and biases, etc. But there's a general assumption, yeah, but if you've got really big data, then we can get around those problems and we can learn more or less anything. Well, the answer is you certainly can't be sure to learn even some very simple causal relationships, no matter how big the data. And I'll give you an example to explain that. Just imagine that we've got trillions of data on the relationship between two binary variables, an independent variable X and a variable Y that we believe depends on X. And we want to learn the relationship between X and Y. So we observe trillions of data points for X and Y. They're going to be pairs of values. So surely we've got to be able to learn the relationship between X and Y. But suppose there's zero correlation between X and Y, i.e. in all of these trillions of pairs of observations, when X is zero, Y is equally likely to be zero or one. Then the best machine learning algorithms have to conclude that there is no relationship. But what if I told you that X and Y simply represent two light bulbs where zero is off and one is on? So here's the observations for light bulb X. And here's the observations for light bulb Y. And what if I also told you that there's a switch Z such that if the switch is off and X is on, Y is going to be on. And if the switch is off and X is off, then Y is going to be off. But if the switch is on and X is on, Y is going to be off. If the switch is on and X is off, Y is going to be on. Then that hidden switch provides a completely deterministically causal relationship between X and Y. Once we know the switch value on or off, the value of Y is completely determined by the value of X. We have this deterministic causal model, whereby if Z is zero, then Y is X, else Y is not X. Machine learning from data can never learn that very simple causal relationship. But of course, knowledge with data can. And this example also demonstrates how we can have causation without correlation. So in summary, data-driven machine learning methods applied to typical medical observational data sets produce bias and flawed predictions and can't be used to reason about interventions and counterfactuals. The observed outcome of interest, which we're trying to predict, may be wrong for many records. So any model that scores well with respect to predictive accuracy is just replicating past errors. Any records related to people not tested or assessed for a particular outcome will wrongly indicate the outcome didn't happen. Data sets are typically biased towards people with specific disease or risk factors. And this not only means we learn little about people who don't have that condition, and why, but we also end up with biased and flawed predictions, as in Bergson's paradox. The impact of interventions learned from observational data 
will be wrong if you want to use the model for decision support at Simpson's paradox. And causal models are certainly needed for reasoning about interventions. We've seen that Bayesian nets provide a rigorous framework and calculus for causal modelling that enable us to resolve paradoxes from observational data and move to levels two and three of Pearl's ladder of causation. And finally, we also saw that no matter how big the data, pure data-driven machine learning may be unable to learn simple causal relationships. Now, there are many who are unaware of the Bayesian developments and who feel that the real solutions to the problems that I've spoken about will come about with the advent of big data and increasingly powerful machine learning algorithms. But I feel very strongly that much of this big data drive is going to be problematic. So big data churned through pure machine learning algorithms more often than not delivers rubbish. And it's the combination of knowledge and I guess what we call smart data, which generates causal models that make sense. And the Bayesian approach is the most effective method for this kind of smart data.